Uh, however, by the 1980s, uh, by a curious combination of many elite lawyers moving out of bar activity, seeing it less and less relevant to their lives, particularly as the growth of corporate law as opposed to litigation, uh, their lives are busier, bar associations seem less important to them, and uh, minority lawyers moving into bar associations, that you begin to have a kind of leadership cadre of black lawyers particularly, but other minority lawyers moving up in the bar associations and using the bar associations as levers to put pressure on corporations to try to improve their diversity record, and in particular to hire more minority lawyers. In 1989, Dennis Archer, who eventually becomes chair of, of the president of the ABA in, 19, uh, in 2004, starts something called the Minority Council Demonstration Project. And uh, that project expressly is intended to get more, to hire more minority law firms. Because Dennis Archer comes out of a solo practice, small black law firm practice background. This eventually gets a number of major corporations to put money into providing legal services to minority law firms, which eventually helps to drive more black partners from major law firms to go work in small minority firms. Uh, the other major factor Ellie's already mentioned, which is the growing competitiveness of the legal services industry, price pressure, particularly beginning in the late 1980s, early 1990s. This leads to, to borrow Mark Lanner's uh, always a wonderful phrase, the golden age of the minority law firm, uh, which happens, roughly speaking, in around 1990 or thereabouts. You have law firms, uh, minority law firms, that have almost 100 lawyers, that have branches in several cities. Uh, you have several cities that have developing minority corporate law firms. Uh, to jump ahead by 2000, almost all of them have either shrunk or been eliminated. Why? Ellie's already suggested some of them. They were too big to be small, too small to be big. Uh, they couldn't compete with the really big firms, but they were too big to be to boutiques at that size. They were the victims of their own success. Their lawyers were cherry-picked away. Uh, they had a harder time recruiting junior lawyers as the law firms opened up and became more willing to hire junior black lawyers. Uh, also, in an interesting cultural issue, I wonder if it happened in Jewish law firms, that black lawyers who went to minority firms thought they were making a cultural choice uh, in which they'd have to work less hard than if they were in the majority firms. That turned out to be a disaster for these firms. Uh, and a number of things about the economics of, pra of practicing law change. I could talk more about this and be happy to in question and answer. But let me say, so what's the takeaway for this group and for the relationship between blacks and Jews as we think about these issues? Uh, well, today, the largest minority law firms are Hispanic. Right? There's a law firm that has over 300 lawyers uh, made up. Uh, that what's driving this is Cubans in Miami, Miami, where Miami has been a very large uh, growth in the legal sector, in part being fueled by the growth of Latin American practice. Uh, so there aren't that many law, uh, black corporate law firms that are successful, which raises a question I think that you've been thinking about in your own context. What's the importance of preserving identity-based institutions in the legal profession and elsewhere? Uh, as we're here at Cardozo, as part of Yeshiva University, you could ask this question, but you could ask it about Harvard, Howard University. You could ask it about, is it important to have minority or black law firms? Uh, is that an important thing to uh, preserve? Um, how are the relationships between blacks and Jews evolving in uh, the beginning of the 21st century. There was a very interesting article, some of you may have saw, in the Wall Street Journal, this was probably in the late 1990s, I'm almost done, uh, called the New Black Jewish Alliance. It had to do with the fact that uh, many leading blacks in, uh, in corporate America have been mentored by Jews. Many Jews are now moving up to the very highest levels of uh, uh, success and achievement in corporate America, it raises a question. 
whether or not we are going to see uh, the Jewish lawyers uh, and executives who've moved up to the very highest levels opening up the doors of opportunity for now the next set of groups that are going through in the same way that some of their predecessors did in the earlier period. And this raises, I think, a number of complexities about how Jews and blacks and other groups see each other, reading each other over time. Right, So that one of the things that was said here is that uh, law firms, as I encountered them, uh, as, uh, as Joseph said, it for me has been the ultimate meritocracy. And I see no prejudice. The question is, how does that affect next level groups coming through? Where issues of prejudice, as Larry and others have started us to say, are much more subtle in which Ellie says, in which the set of stereotypes against which, which people are working against are much different. How do we think about what the next phase of what has been a long and very fruitful for both sides uh, uh, interaction between blacks and Jews will move in this much more complicated world of the 21st century? Thank you. Thanks very much.